Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to my channel. This is Joel Duff. And today, mm, let's talk about nectar robbing bees, natural evil, and the image of God. Sounds pretty interesting, huh? We've got that coming up next. Cheaters prosper. Yes, they really do. Hundreds of thousands of species are singularly devoted to some form of parasitic lifestyle. It's a strategy that involves one organism deriving all or much of its resources from a host organism to the detriment of that host. Many of these strategies make us cringe. For example, a tapeworm living in the intestines of a mammal or numerous horror stories of wasps like this one using other living things as host to grow their young. However, many relationships that organisms engage in are far more subtle, though no less selfish. Consider, for example, this many species of bees which obtain pollen and nectar from flowers. They're essentially they're taking resources for themselves with no conscious thought of how their action might be helping what, what you could think of as the victim. In this case, the resource stealing is a two way street since the flower is also using the bees energy resources to transfer its pollen to another flower. Now, my portrayal of this relationship might be rather shocking because our typical anthropomorphic description of the relationship of flowers and bees is a long-standing mutualism, a sort of win-win love fest, right? Plants producing flowers use some of their stored energy resources to make this sweet nectar. In exchange for producing this otherwise useless product to them, the bees are enticed to obtain the nectar by what climbing through the flower, past the stamens, the male parts, and past the carpels, the female parts of the flower. Plants sometimes even expend more energy to paint ultra vivid road maps for their pollinating bees, helping them find their way to the nectar pot at the end of the rainbow. But ask yourselves, are the bees and the flowers taking advantage of each other and therefore acting solely out of pure self-interest? Or are they helping each other out of some act of altruism? Or neither? You know, Darwin himself actually pondered this very same question. Here, this quote from him. Natural selection can't possibly produce any modification in any one species exclusively for the good of another species. Though throughout nature, one species incessantly takes advantage of and profits by the structure of another. But natural selection can and often does produce structures for the direct injury of other species, as we see in the fang of the adder or in the ovipositor of the ichneumon, by which its eggs are deposited. That's the parasitic wasp. Let's come back to that intriguing question for a moment and just ponder these bees a little bit further. If the bees follow the pathway that the flowers have, speaking anthropomorphically, built for them, the flowers will be pollinated and have an opportunity to produce a bounty of seeds. Those seeds will in turn ensure that there's a new generation of plants along with a new batch of nectar for the next generation of bees. This is a pretty sweet deal that the plants and insects have going here, even if both partners are only really thinking of their own success. Let's say we grant that some bee and flower relationships are mutually beneficial. Even if based on mutual self-interest, we can't help but realize that not all organisms form such advantageous relationships, right? Darwin just mentioned one. There's hardly a living species or biological system yet studied, including human beings, in which cheating doesn't exist or in which the cheater doesn't find at least short-term success, right? We might call this, you know, to put a positive spin on it, Maybe we call it opportunism or maybe pragmatically using the system's rules like the tax codes of life. So what are the tax codes of life? Well, they're the natural laws that govern the interactions of the physical universe. In this case, these laws include those that govern how success is measured in reproduction, something that evolutionary biology would call fitness. And that reproduction then is comparing one organism to another. We describe these rules in the form of processes such as natural selection and mutations that allow organisms to adapt to new circumstances and compete for resources. So how should we think about nectar robbing bees? Well, in this case, you're looking at a picture of nectar robbing uh, aphids, which clearly are parasitic on the organisms. There's not a lot of benefit uh, that this plant's getting from uh, these aphids on it. But with bees, you know, we generally think of them as a sort of a mutualistic relationship. However, Let's talk about ones that aren't behaving in a mutualistic way. 
There are many species of bees that slice and chew and poke through the base of a flower and then sip on the nectar. As a result, they're not getting the pollen you know, on them. They're not getting the nectar in what we'd say is the right way from the flower's perspective. Nectar robbers have adopted strategies to forage or I'll call it cheat the normal nectar supply system that the plant has put in place to use the bees as their little pollen fairies. As a result, the flowers don't benefit from its expensive nectar production service. Nectar bearing flowering plants, it, they're not oblivious to the fact that some insects are stealing their resources without them getting any return. They have developed mechanisms to make it harder for nectar robbers to get away with their contraband. But cheaters find ways to cheat and will always find a way around the system, whatever new adaptations a plant might come up with. Since cheating is such a prosperous way of life, naturally some plants have taken notice and taken to cheating themselves. Wang and Wu uh, reported in 2013 that many species of plants are non-secretors. <laughs> what does that mean? They live among their cousins that are nectar secretors, right? Members of the same species, individuals in the same population that don't secrete nectar. They, what are they doing? They're enjoying the benefits of bees that come along thinking they're going to get a reward only to find that the flower provides nothing for them. However, the flower gets a whole bunch out of it because it gets pollinated despite giving nothing back to the bee, right? They're pollinated and can use the extra resources they have because they didn't share them with the bees. And what do they use those resources for? They use them to make more seeds, right? They put more, more energy into the actual reproductive process, producing more offspring, in which case we'd say they're more fit. But the bees aren't dumb, at least speaking anthropomorphically again. After all, they don't like to be cheated. And so they learn tricks to avoid and punish flowers that don't produce nectar. Tit for tat. They're going back and forth. This sets up a vicious feedback loop of adaptations which result in no single harmonious relationship being agreed upon, but rather promotes the maintenance of multiple behavioral strategies all at one time. So within the population of plants and the population of the, the insects, neither can come to the perfect solution, the perfect beneficial way for all parties to, to be happy. One strategy might be more successful at one moment in time, but any winning strategy is temporary since winning in this case, they cause a change in the dynamics of the system, which assures that the, strength, the same strategy will be less successful going forward. After all, if the flowers that don't produce nectar always win and produce so much more offspring, well, what are they going to do? They produce more offspring that don't produce nectar. Eventually you're going to have a whole bunch of flowers that don't produce nectar. If they don't produce nectar, the bees are going to start coming, stop coming to them all together, in which case they don't get pollinated anymore. In other words, it's a short-term win for the flower. It's a temporary win. They can win for a few generations, but then they ultimately end up being losers, which is why the flowers that produce nectar and use more energy to produce nectar eventually are going to be the ones that are the survivors in the long term. So I'm reminded <laughs> by a similar dance that teachers and some students play, that I play with my students. The former, right, myself, are constantly devising new strategies to prevent cheating on exams. While there's always a student that's willing to find and exploit a way around the system rather than putting in the effort to learn the material and take the test in the intended manner. But here's the thing. Plants don't just cheat by not providing the expected resources. They can also be parasitic on insects themselves. Some flowers produce pheromones that trick wasps to copulate with them. It's a really effective use of energy. I say energy because it takes energy to make that particular pheromone, all right? That's a, that's a product that they have to make. But in exchange for using that energy to make that pheromone, they're getting pollinated. And, but it's really hard to see how the wasp benefits from this all. Well, after all, it thinks it found a mate and it's expending energy trying to copulate and it receives nothing in return because it's not going to end up making more wasps as a result. These plants have essentially, no, not essentially, they have in any definition of 
parasitism. They have parasitized that wasp. It's a bit ironic given the fact that nearly all wasps are parasites themselves. All right. So it's like, you know, you're a parasite. I'm going to parasitize you. You know, let's face it. Cheaters often prosper. It's something that we see in nature all the time. At least they do in the short term. And that's a really, that's a really key thing here. At some point, students that cheat will find that their profits, which is a better grade, right? may become a liability since they didn't actually learn the material and they will perform worse in their future classes or in their careers, right? It helped them temporarily, but it doesn't help them in the long run. Nectar robbing can be seen as a very successful strategy, but the success again is gonna be short term. Let's think what would happen if nectar robbing bees were super successful, right? If they're too successful, then what's gonna happen is the nectar producing plants are going to be a whole lot less able to attract true the rule following pollinators right and as a result they're going to produce a lot fewer seeds because they're not going to get pollinated fewer seeds means smaller future populations of that particular plant that particular flower fewer flowers means fewer res resources for the nectar robbers in the most extreme situation the nectar robber may cause its host to go extinct because many nectar robbers are generalists, though, meaning they're able to rob from multiple species, that might not be lethal to those particular bees, but it certainly has an effect on the plant species and other bees, not to mention other insects and other birds and so forth that might have been relying on that particular plant. It messes with the system, but robbing and cheating is part of the natural system, the natural balance, I guess you could say, of the interactions of organisms. Now, you might be tempted to say that nectar robbers or flowers that are enticing insects to copulate with them aren't playing by the rules or aren't playing fair. But what exactly does that mean? Like, what would you mean by that if you said that they're not being fair? They're not, they're not playing right. If stealing nectar proves an efficient strategy, meaning that it results in those bees more reliably obtaining a food source, it's better for the bees, those bees may have more offspring which is evidence that those bees have profited from the strategy. The, the strategy works for them. They're successful as a result. Can we say they're doing something wrong? Like, are we, are, we, are, we, are we providing an ethical statement about these bees and these plants are taking advantage of insects? Is there some rule that they're breaking that forbids them from taking nectar in that manner? You know, animals don't cheat and they don't steal, and they don't lie. Even if we might, as I've repeatedly used above, use the language to describe their actions as if they had motives derived from some conscious thought or planning. How can they be doing something wrong if they're not making conscious choices? Bees that rob nectar from flowers, they're not sinners. They're not disobeying the, the law of God. They've not committed a transgression against, well, let me just say, divine law. Rather, they're acting within the rules of the, di the divine creator has established. Using terms such as rob or steal or share are ascribing to them the capacity of purposeful or moral action that they really don't possess. All right, I got to stop here and point out that this is where we see one of the distinctions between humans and other animals. Human beings aren't simply driven by like a natural code book that says that any strategy that helps us to survive is acceptable within the parameters of the created order. It's not that we aren't created as physical beings with biological operating systems like other creatures and thus have the same impulses as physical beings, but we're also conscious beings capable of understanding how our decisions actually affect each other. We can plan for our future rather than being a slave to our biological present and our past condition. We can consciously decide, although I admit that it can be difficult at times, right? To not engage in behaviors that we might find ourselves tempted to engage in, knowing our negligence can lead to suffering of another individual in part as part of God's creation. As a Christian, this is the part that we understand as being created in the image of God. In the functional and relational understanding of the meaning of this phrase, it made in the image of God, we might sum it up as Vanderbrink in 2020 did. The fact that we are called by God and able to respond to that call. This speaks to our free will and our ability to contemplate 
our origins and our purpose in being unlike the bees and flowers that have no such capacity. Human beings, they do exhibit similar behavioral patterns and tendencies as we see in other animals and have similar that have a similar biological basis, right? Human beings do consciously cheat, they steal and lie, but we shouldn't excuse our actions as just a, that's our nature, something that we obviously have no responsibility for. Christians refer to this as our sinful nature. The inclination of a dog, like my dogs right here, or a bee or a bird to like steal from one another is an amoral action for them. But those same actions take, an take on a moral significance for us. We don't call our dogs acts sinful. I mean, my dogs, you know, if I turn around while there's food on the table, they're, re they're ready to swipe it right away. They're fully aware of what's going on and they know how, and they, and they actually know what I expect of them, which is that they don't do that. But their biological instinct takes over and they'll do whatever they can to get that food. So we don't call, but we don't call our dogs act sinful, whereas we would call a similar selfish action by our own selves a sin because we have been explicitly commanded not to engage in such behaviors. And we can understand the consequences of our actions and what they'll have on other people. We've been granted the capacity to understand the impact of our actions and have been given the option to choose not to act according to our desires. Despite this, we often act selfish, right? We have selfish desires over and, and desire things over the benefit of others, just like these dogs do. Okay, at this point, hey, I've managed to stumble into some theological landmines, including the very difficult topic of free will and natural evil. And I'm not going to explore those much further here. I want to take a, a, a little bit of a tangent and now explore the response of young earth creationists to the origin of parasites and the perfect paradise. How do they respond to parasites and nectar robbing bees uh, in this present world? Put another way, how do creationists respond to the question of why do parasites even exist in the world today? For many young earth creationists, the original earth was created as a perfect paradise. There's no death. Presumably no organisms took advantage of each other for their survival. Now, I think most young earth creationists would agree with me that birds and bees and my dogs aren't sinning when they take the actions that they take. And yet they still find the language of stealing or cheating by animals and plants as something that they would not expect in this initially created perfect state, right? This perfect ecological state of the earth in the Garden of Eden. So then that leaves them with the question, what caused parasitic and cheating behavior to break into or disrupt the perfect harmony of this prelapsarian world? Many young earth creationists respond to this, I'll say aberrant in their judgment, bee behavior as being the product of irreparable damage to the original good creation caused by Adam's sin. I mean, just look at answers to Genesis, one article after another. For example, speaking of parasitic wasps as these horrendous life cycles were not in existence in the beginning. They are part of God's judgment, right? That's a frequent quote you'll see in multiple different articles or something to that effect. Are they now, instead of playing by the original rules, are they now going about seeking to thwart God's original intention for them to like pollinate flowers? I don't think there's any merit in this viewpoint, right? Look, cheating strategies among living things from the human perspective are really nothing more than an intricate dance of natural selection operating as part of God's good creation. The nectar stealing bees actions are amoral rather than good or evil in the same way that a plant is not being amoral or evil for producing flowers with no nectar and fooling bees into pollinating them. Now, generally, I think that young earth creationists view the plant pollinator interaction as good and part of the original design. I've read this many times that, you know, bees were designed to, to pollinate flowers. But this is in spite of the fact that both parties in the interaction between the bee and the flower are really unable to consciously enter into a relationship of good for each other, right? They're, they're not thinking about the good of the other they are thinking about how their own survival i'm getting a resource they're both providing a resource to one another you know for example ginger allen in 2010 an article for answers in genesis stated 
The plant and pollinator have adapted together under God's original design. Some species, you will have to agree, have a unique harmonious relationship that could not have arisen randomly, right? This had to be part of God's original design. This harmonious relationship is designed while mutations and other decay of the creation after sin into the world are reasons why this harmonious relationship has nectar robber cheating bees today, all right? So where did the cheating come from? Ah, oh, that's got to be Adam's sin, right? Just, you know, causing mutations to occur. And now mutations have happened to these bees, causing them to develop aberrant behaviors such that they try to cheat on the flowers and get the nectar from them without pollinating them. Now, Gordon Wilson, who, you know, I think he may be one of the more nuanced creation biologists today. He's a, faculty, a biology faculty member at a Christian uh, college. Uh, and he writes for Answers in Genesis and, and says this about the origins of this pollination and pollinator relationship. Natural selection acting on divinely programmed variability adapted each plant species to be suited for one particular type of pollinator. Likewise, certain insect pollinators were able to develop adapted anatomy and behavior to forage for the pollen and nectar of their species so the plant could be successfully pollinated. Hmm. Now that's a little different than what I just said, because I suggested, based on a whole bunch of other articles and answers in Genesis and other creationist site, sites, that God created bees and flowers together as, as a plant pollinator system. But here Gordon Wilson is actually suggesting that there are that natural selection is selecting for characteristics that develop this particular relationship. Now, I think what he's dealing with here is the fact that um, there are many, many, many different species of bees, many, many different species of plants, all of which are of the same kind. And so there originally were only like a couple types of each of these kinds that then have developed into new species of plants, especially since after the flood, there's a whole different world and a different ecology. And therefore, the original relationship that God created uh, wouldn't be good enough for the today's environment. And therefore, there needed to be adaptation and need to be development of additional relationships that may not have existed originally. And so he's trying to explain the origin of those relationships through natural selection, basically through evolutionary processes that would have developed these relationships of plant pollinators. So he's invoking natural selection here in part because insects and plants were created on, well, there's another problem too. They were created on a different day. And so they weren't even together in the original creation. Now for 24 hours, you know, in the, in the six day creation, in the young earth creationist worldview. And he also knows that the flood, as I said before, would have drastically changed the number and distribution of species of both plants and insects. And so the current really tight relationship of some pollinators to specific plant species he believes must have built their relationships after creation and then after the flood. Notice that the pollinators have developed anatomical and behavioral characteristics to match the present day world. He does go on to assure us later that this isn't the result of any like new information. No, 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 no. These, these, these insects and these plants are not coming up with new genes or new variations in order to overcome and solve these problems, all right? These challenges from the environment after the flood. He says that all of this is divinely programmed variation, just installed at the creation. So even though these same plant pollinator interactions weren't necessarily in play in the original creation, in the original Garden of Eden, all that variation to allow these interesting and wonderful relationships were all there from the beginning and they were exposed by natural selection or evolutionary processes later on uh, so like how would that work well presumably successful pollination by a pollinator with a particular uh flower with a certain amount of pollen all right or, or i'm sorry nectar would have entailed a designed relationship that would have formed through this natural selection on variable traits. So now, but that raises a, a really interesting question though. What about robbers? What about nectar robber characteristics? 
right? Was nectar robbing characteristic also part of the original package of variation that God made? Or would Wilson invoke mutations that have degraded information and thus created a new maladapted behavior of nectar robbing? Now, I say maladaptive because it sounds like it's bad for the plants. However, it's adaptive for the insects, right? I mean, a nectar robber benefits right, by, through the cheating process. It can sometimes get more nectar than the bees that are doing it the right way. And so you can think of it as a beneficial change for the bee. Although, as I said before, it could be a temporary beneficial change, right? A thousand generations later, and they've killed off some of the flowers because of their robbing activity, then, it, then it's not beneficial. But remember, beneficial and maladaptive characteristics are all relative to the environment at any particular moment in time. All right, the variations in the line of thought that I'm going down are really endless because, as I've already pointed out, nectar robbing is only maladaptive from the perspective of the plant. So I really don't know how creationists would characterize such features that are both helpful and harmful at the same time. Although I think you'll find that a close examination of nearly any biological interaction between organisms is fraught with beneficial and negative aspects on both sides in virtually everything you would ever study, right? So let me wrap this up by just saying, for me, I find all these distinctions to be a little less than useful. All of these different behaviors of bees and plants are the products of rules that God has established to govern the interactions of the elements of his creation. As such, they're all good products of his sovereign will. Here's a picture of a, a parasitic plant from my backyard. Um, daughter, D-O-D-D-E. I think I believe it's D-O-D-D-E-R. Right? And this is a plant that parasitizes other plants. And that's something that I studied uh, as part of my postdoc. And so there, there are thousands of species of plants that um, interact with other plants and steal resources from other plants. Right, this, this one plant, the orange vine, is not photosynthetic. It doesn't produce its own energy. And so therefore, it has to steal energy from other plants. It's hard to imagine they benefit for the, the host plant right, the plant that's being parasitized. Um, there's definitely a benefit to the, the, the daughter, though. Is this an evil relationship? No. It's found, it's using the rules of how nature operates, or it's God's established interactions of the elements of creation that I just mentioned, right? The rules of how organisms go about uh, learning how to survive and adapt and change in this world. And the parasitic behavior itself is a very successful behavior. Now, if I'm a parasite on my family and I'm parasitic on anybody else, any other person, a, a, a human being, right? I am consciously disobeying the law of God, right? And although that might be my human inclination, that might be part of my biological working, like, like my, my desire to um, be, create success in myself at the, at the expense of somebody else. Um, since I've been given the law, right? Been given the word of God and have knowledge of what is right and wrong. My act coming from my, like, you know, from my flesh, right? To, to, to use the words of, of Paul, I guess, my, my acts of desire of the flesh, all right? Me acting out on those would be what we call sin, right? I'm transgressing the law of God. This particular parasitic plant, not transgressing the law of God, right? Simply behaving according to the rules that God has laid out for how it can survive. And the fact that it causes damage to another organism is not death in the sense of something that's evil in the world. It's simply the natural outworkings of interactions of organisms. Well, maybe more on parasitic plants at another time. I don't think I've, uh, well, I did start a series a long time ago in which I was going to discuss parasitic plants. Uh, and to be honest, like nobody watched that video. I thought, man, parasitic plants are so cool. Uh, I can do a whole like series on different kinds of parasitic plants and the types of things that I've uh, looked at in terms of their genomes and 
uh, other aspects of them. Um, but it was like a, of the least interest of virtually any video that I had made. Super disappointment to me, but you know, I, I'm weird. So I guess I have to acknowledge the fact that maybe I find things interesting that nobody else does. Uh, anyway, daughter, I, you know, if, you, if you're interested in hearing more about it, uh, maybe I'll make a video on this particular plant and the, and the cool uh, genomics of how daughter came to be a parasitic plant. But alas, our time has drawn nigh and it is time for me to depart. Till next time, thanks so much for listening and blessings to all of you. Bye-bye.